uh, as I promised at the start of my paper, I will um, talk about the theory more than all the data because I think the theory is what we can learn from um, and the data is not always digestible if you're not fluent in Hebrew and Greek, which I know not everyone is. So I'll partly talk generally through my paper and partly read bits which I think are the interesting or relevant bits for today. I begin with the quotation from Francis Burkett, 1898. It is written in Greek more uncouth than has ever before been issued from Cambridge University Press. <laughs> One aspect of my paper is to suggest Cambridge University Press is not that uncouth and the Greek is actually better than people suspect. But this is an evaluation of the Greek of Aquila, well known as the so-called slavishly literal translator of the Bible in the second century CE. His style can be typified by one of the few surviving fragments, which I have on the handout there as the first passage. Um, there's slightly different variants on it, but as you can see, in the beginning, en kephalio, this is again Genesis 1, we use this quite a lot, it's helpful. I think you all know the passage now. <laughs> 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 yes. En kephalio, instead of en arche, because the Hebrew boy sheet has within it the root rosh, and rosh is a head. So he finds a matching parallel root, head kephale, so kephalion, which actually in Greek really means in brief or something like that. Uh, he fashioned ktizo uh, as opposed to poieo because poieo is always u already used for another Hebrew word, azar, so he needs to distinguish different Hebrew roots. Hot theos, or perhaps in some manuscript traditions just theos, because actually Hebrew Elohim doesn't have the definite article, so you drop the definite article. Sun tonuronon. Now, who knows Greek? <laughs> I know you, you had footnotes in your translation about this sort of thing in the Ecclesiastes. Sun, wrong case for sun. Sun t should take dative or possibly genitive in some cases. Uh, that's, so that's sort of with the, the heaven, with the wrong case, and with the earth. Um, it's quite hard to read in Greek. I'll come back at the end to Sun. I think it's uh, straightforward. But the Sun here, why, why has he done Sun? Because there's one word in Hebrew, et, which has two meanings. One is to indicate the direct object, which is here, and one is to mean with. But he's taken that second meaning, with, and used it wherever the sign of the direct object is, which is untranslatable. So this translation style, if we're talking about literal, this is the literal translations of, it's the mother of all literal translations. <laughs> and the estimations, therefore, of it, of Greek, have accordingly often been critical or condemnatory. And so my paper is really, firstly, to work out what this Greek is, and that's all the technical Greek material, which I won't trouble you with. And second, what can we learn about this, about literalism, and what are translators doing when they're going so-called literal. In due course, I will dispense entirely with the word literal, but I'll use it now as a shorthand. Uh, we can read, for example, Jerome, who was familiar and quoted this passage. He actually says, because Hebrew has, in addition to the article, other prefixes as well, he must, with an unhappy pedantry, translate syllable by syllable, letter by letter. Thus, sunton oronon kai suntengen a construction which neither Greek nor Latin omits of. Um, and people have gone on. Burkitt himself talks about pedantic literalism in the same way as Jerome. Uh, others, you just use origins phrase, slavishly literal, which the, the Greek of that is quite interesting. Duluon, he is a slave. Te hebraica lexi, to the Hebrew word. Um, and uh, in fact, Katz, Peter Katz Waltz, talks about how Aquila also invents lots of new words, and Katz calls these quasi-Greek whimsical coinages. 
funny little things. Um, when, unfortunately, we can't fully study Aquila because he's only preserved in brief quotations or allusions, but we have one Bible translation very, very close to Aquila, and that is the Greek translation of Ecclesiastes, which reflects many of the similar elements. So my own work has been looking at Ecclesiastes, since we have a complete running text of that, and suggesting that actually there are many, many features which suggest this is actually quite sophisticated, intelligent Greek, and not such simple Greek. But let me look firstly at the question of literalism. What do we mean by literalism? It's been used quite a few times at this conference. Uh, my Oxford colleague, who I respect greatly, uh, said it's useful even if it's questionable. Um, but let me quote an introduction to translation studies written over 12 years ago in the first edition, which says, the literal versus free translation debate is an imprecise and circular debate from which theories, theorists have emerged only in the last 50 years. So if this was written 12 years ago, that means 62 years ago we got away from the literal free debate. In actual fact, in biblical studies, this is not true at all. In Septuagint studies and other areas of uh, what we might call classical biblical studies, people still debate how far something is literal or free. There is the great work by James Barr, The Typology of Literalism in Ancient Biblical Translations, what date was this, on 1979, which is quite subtle in his presentation of the problems of literal and, literal and free, but he's still stuck in the mode of literal versus free. And I think the problem also applies to Nida, the dynamic or formal equivalence is just a more sophisticated uh, dichotomy. Some of it, I suspect, goes back to Russian constructivism, uh, and that is the root of much of this, and that also lays the grounds for Chomsky and linguistics, and of some modern translation theorists, such as Gideon Turi, Israeli-Russian, um, no surprise there, although Turi's work is very, very useful in translation theory. Um, so the, the dichotomy of literal and free um, still underlies much of what we do. And in biblical studies, there's a very justifiable reason for it. Firstly, because we have people like Aquila, which seems to justify the concept of a literal or slavishly uh, subservient reading. And also because we are so focused on Bible translations from the King James Version onwards in the English-speaking world, which are also seeming to fit into that literal and free pattern. So in biblical studies, focus on translation has still been upon the word, or one might even better say, upon the morpheme, because word is imprecise, it's a morphological identification, we'll see this in a moment, as the element of equivalence, not even on the word or the semantics, it's on the morpheme, which means you're really breaking it down into little parts and on the question of literal or free. While the United Bible Societies often do employ sophisticated translation theories, the preference in English translations, at least, appears to be for a so-called literal translation. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday in discussion, it's actually, English translations actually are often done by Bible scholars, not by Bible translators. The oddity is that any discussion of literal is not found in contemporary translation theories. And the word as a unit of determinative meaning, any word as a determinative meaning, is not upheld in linguistics anymore. Linguistics doesn't care about words, it cares about context, pragmatics, uh, discourse. So let us consider then, just to show you some of the complexity of this, I'll give a really obvious example from English. Um, and that's the passage from Matthew 5, 8, which is on the handout. Oh, and I've missed off, I think I've missed off one of the translations. <laughs> I missed off the key one, um, <laughs> the Phillips translation, the supposedly free one. Um, but anyway, I offer three different translations. King James Version, good news, is, is that GNT? Is that good? I don't know, actually, <laughs> is it good news? Good news. Yes. Greek New Testament, but it's English, so called. Good News Translation. Good News Translation. 
Uh, and then also, I have Philips, but I've lost it in my notes and on the, on the handout. Um, Philips has, um, well, I'll tell you what Philips has when we get to it. Um, so the first one, the King James Version, would be considered by many to be the most literal, if we use such terms, for various reasons. It has the closest lexical equivalence. That is to say, it's a Forget about lexical, it's a quantitative matching. It has quantity elements that are the same. Doesn't matter about semantics or anything else, it's counting words here. We can match words quantitatively. Note that such formal equivalence is merely a matching of the number of words. Other potentially matching elements, be it semantic or etymological equivalence, are separate issues and need to be distinguished from a mere one-to-one -one equivalence. And that's one of the problems of talking about literal. Are you talking about semantics, number, form, shape, and so on? The good news, by contrast to the KGV, omits the four, for they shall see God. And therefore, some could say it's displaying less, well, it is displaying less quantitative equivalence. But the difficulty with this concept is twofold. First, as the resulting English is grammatically competent in both cases, it is not necessary for the words to be written any other way. So it's grammatically satisfying, and therefore there's nothing wrong with it about being literal, but equally, equally there's nothing wrong with it not being literal. The translator has produced a perfectly coherent English sentence, and there's no need necessarily to vary the word order. So there's nothing in a sense special about it. It could be said the formal equivalence only exists thanks to the necessities of the language and not necessarily from the source text itself. So it's the language that produces the sentence, not the source text necessarily. The translation of anything follows an easy, easy method of translating, but only because it fits in with the target language system as well. If it didn't, you, it would be changed. Second, and in contrast to this, it also must break equivalence according to the demands of target language. So there's no, never any true literalism. Thus, R, A-R-E, is added owing to the lack of copula in the Greek. So it's not keeping pure co um, quantitative equivalence. The definite article is omitted before God, since definite articles are unnecessary in English. There, and elements are added such as in to render the dative of heart. We don't have a dative in English, not morphologically, so that you have to change it to the grammatical target language. So it, it's not literal in that sense. Um, one could go further and note how the verbal element of opsontai, one word in Greek, is rendered by three elements in English, they shall see. So actually quantitative equivalence isn't really accurate. We can also see the change in word order of theon before the verb, thus resulting in the loss of emphasis from the Greek. The Greek is ton theon opsontai, it is God you will see. KGV, for they shall see God, is actually a poor translation in the end. All rather obvious points demonstrate that even an apparently straightforward translation conforming to English grammar and syntax and yet can be said to follow the source only when it's within the demands of the target language. We may go further and note how the asyndeton, the lack of the for, in the GNT translation, they will see God, exclamation mark, hence no equivalent for the that, hoti, in Greek, actually lays stress on the apodosis on the second mark, mark two by the exclamation mark. So actually, if anything, the Greek New Testament version is more literal because it's conveying the emphasis of the Greek there. Moving away from lexical equivalence, we find communicative equivalence in the GNT version. On the level of the phrase or the discourse, the translator recognizes the force of the expression and thereby translates the force of the utterance. They will see God, exclamation mark. Finally, Philip's translation, which sadly I forgot to include, but is often much maligned, but can de demonstrate an important concept I've not looked at yet, 
The view that an equivalent word is literal is built upon an unquestioned default, default translation equivalent. We have in our minds prototypical translation equivalents, whereby a standard equivalent in the target language is taken as the default for translating a particular element in the source language. Where this default comes from can be as simple as the first meaning learnt in a beginner's grammar. And I spend all my time telling first year students, do not write, I, I perceive God, literally, I lift up my eyes, because there's no such thing as literal, and usually they get the literal bit wrong anyway. But uh, what we learn in our beginner's grammar is determinative for what we translate words from, uh, by. Um, and I'll show this in a moment. It is, if nothing else, the default translation choice is often the one that is most common in the language, or hence the first entry in the dictionaries. There are, I've seen some examples this weekend of people doing that mistake, but I'm not going to name and shame. <laughs> in biblical studies, we have the particular problem that classical English translations are so familiar to us King James Version, we've talked about this already, that these translations dominate our own readings of the Hebrew and Greek and can even feed back into the lexicons themselves. Where the particular renderings that are familiar to us are derived from is often a long tradition that gives sanctity to something with very, very little support. Even our dictionary equivalents are actually going back to medieval, if not to the Septuagint itself. Thus, here, blessed are the pure in heart. This, unfortunately, has become an idiom in English, so we think it's perfectly acceptable in English, the feedback from the KJV that Professor Barton would talked about. But it's questionable whether heart is the best understanding of the expression in modern terms. Heart, in this context, probably goes back to lev Hebrew, and actually this is like Psalm 24. Hebrew, lave, almost always is translated by heart. I brought up on my little computer, I just had the ESV, just because it happened to be open. I don't know, it's just what it says on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I mean, one could go through Google heart, lave in ESV, Genesis 6, 5, the intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. So the thoughts of his heart, so heart is more like a mind there. Uh, the Lord said in his heart, what does that actually mean? God knows, <laughs> quite literally. Uh, in the integrity of my heart, Genesis 20, um, and then Pharaoh hardened his heart. Are any of these occurrences of heart actually a correct translation? Well, we all learned lave equals heart in first year grammar. And so sure enough, we've got heart in all the translations, but in not one of these cases is heart a suitable translation. Firstly, because heart is an anatomical organ, which they didn't know about because they didn't do anatomy, or not in, not in the way we know about it, and therefore it's problematic. Secondly, how do you harden a heart? You get a heart attack if you have <laughs> harden your arteries, so that can't be right. How do you speak in your heart? If it's, if it's about thinking, do you think in your heart? Heart is simply wrong. I don't know how to translate it, but it's wrong, and no one's ever questioned it in, in any real way. Why, why do we say lave heart? Very simple. Greek translated as kardia, as, as in the, the we then get in Matthew, and Latin as core. So actually, what is our translation of the Bible? It's, we have not thought about it for two and a half thousand years. It goes back to the Septuagint. Yes? It, it, it does, and, and you could say, well, the Israelites did as well because they had some Egyptian influence and there was some anatomy, but they didn't actually understand what the heart did in that way. If you actually read what they say about the heart, it's rather confused. It is, it is true that, <coughs> excuse me, isn't it, that um, up till Christian Barnard did what he did, uh, we were content with the word heart. After that, we had to adjust thinking of what we meant by it ourselves. Yes, probably. Um, and probably you could actually say, well, actually, in 16th century England, heart meant something which it doesn't mean now. But you wouldn't use, 
Um, I mean, even if you look at Little Scott, you have things like uh, damsel. You wouldn't use damsel in a modern translation, so why would you use heart if it meant something differently then as now? Um, the point is, what we see is a, uh, a, um, a, a literal translation is actually a lazy translation, and a false translation is a literal one if, in, if we look at equivalence in those terms. Likewise, it ignores polysemy. And I'm interested in the paper we had this morning from the Project 7000, that the computer is, uh, you're keeping for main physical objects, you're keeping the same translation equivalent. But there's no linguistic principle which allows translation equivalents between languages to be the same, because there's polysemy and, uh, in different languages and it, it works out differently. So bait, Hebrew house in the Bible, if you always translated the house, you wouldn't actually get the real meaning, because it can mean family, dynasty, household, living, residence, temple, inner chamber, and a house, or which even could actually be a hut rather than a house, and palace. So it's very dangerous if we go those lines. But that's a separate issue. Um, um, Finally, just mention Phillips very briefly. How does Phillips say this? He says, happy are those who are utterly sincere. Dynamic, dynamic equivalence, but actually probably the correct meaning. So it's actually literal in its meaning. Enough on literalism. One could spend a long time basically going into linguistic theory about discourse and pragmatics. How do I understand then a literalistic translation like Ecclesiastes or Aquila? Well, one solution, I think, is to look at the field of neologism or creation of new words. New words are created all the time by translators, unconsciously or consciously. We had earlier today the example of Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky is a perfect example of a text which makes no sense, but we understand what it is. Um, and even Jabberwocky produced new words in the language. Chortle, somewhere between a ch chuckle and a snort, it was first used in Jabberwocky, and we now think it's a word. Uh, so that um, we naturally are uh, susceptible to strange translations. We understand strange translations because they actually make sense, just as Jabberwocky makes sense. So that uh, one aspect of new words is actually one way of understanding new translations. Uh, it's interesting in Alice in Wonderland where Jabberwocky appears, Alice actually says, somehow it seems to fill my head with ideas, only I don't know exactly, I, I don't exactly know what they are. So Alice got the point, it's sort of right, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Linguists even have a, a word for new words. A neologism, which was created 12 years ago in Russian, is protologism, which is a new word which hasn't quite caught up in the language. A non-successful neologism is a protologism, <laughs> which is no longer a protologism itself. It's now become a neologism. <laughs> it can be a very complex area, this. But this is very important because Study of new words firstly shows us how we do translation choices. Secondly, it shows us whether those translation choices are going to work or not. Take the example of Homer, and I mean Homer on this page at this moment. Uh, I might come to another Homer later. Homer's expletive. Probably most of you have heard it, even if you've never seen The Simpsons. It's something like, do. Is that right? <laughs> That, that's it, thank you. you um, I got it wrong and it's important. Why? The popular American cartoon character, Homer Simpson, is remembered most for his catch catchphrase, DO, which in inter interestingly was first written D-O-H. Now it's always written D-O apostrophe H, which itself is an interesting... It's an expression of frustration at his own failure and his own foolishness. Oh, how stupid I fell down the stairs. Its modern origins are already somewhat obscure, and it's only been going for 15 years. But one can derive something of its lexical history. It was first written in the script of The Simpsons as 
an annoyed grunt. Um, but it appears to derive from the Lowell and Hardy films, which I presume most people here are familiar. In those films, Finlayson had used the term doll slow, more slowly than your, you do the Simpson one. Doll. Yeah. In, in uh, Lowell and Hardy, it was more doll, something like that. Um, this was an oblique oath in Lowell and Hardy's films, suggesting the word damn, but he couldn't say that, serving therefore both as a euphemism for damn, a bit like people saying sugar instead of a sh word, um, and also phonetically similar to damn with the duh sound. So there we already have a double root of door as damn, euphemism, and phonetic matching. At the same time, it's also very close to contemporary American expression, which probably influenced the Simpsons, duh, which expresses stupidity of someone else. If you're young, I'm sure no one here, if you're a young teenage American and someone does something <coughs> stupid, you say duh. But instead of the cadence of duh, which is referring to someone else, it's self-referential. And so we actually have a glottal stop, do, rather than duh. So there's a change in the uh, rhythm. So the criticism aimed at someone else implied by duh is thus transformed into self-criticism through a phonetic shift. Do lacks the sarcasm of the prolonged vowel duh and fa the falling tone of it. Finally, the choice of that particular vowel combination, do, and even with the apostrophe, uh, is probably inspired by a combination of both o and no, which we say of ourselves. So in other words, we have about seven semantic phonetic influences on this one catchphrase, which has become a successful protologism. Whether all these factors are the initial reasons for the creation of this expletive by Homer, or some account for its success as a word that has caught on and indeed for its immediate intelligibility, we cannot distinguish whether it's the origins or the success of it. The distinction doesn't matter. Such complex analysis of neologization is difficult enough where we have modern records, but more difficult with ancient records. This brings me to an issue of multiple causation. Multiple causation in linguistics has been discussed for some time. And actually, if you turn over the page, you'll see the examples I'm coming to. In translation studies, multiple causation is an issue only rarely touched upon, although aspects of it are already apparent in functional theories of translation. In this respect, it's founded focus more on the macro level of explanation, those who know the work of Anthony Pym in this regard, more than the micro level of someone like Chesterman. But the model of Neolize Jason, I think, can be helpful for us in lexical study. Let's just take some examples at the top of page two. The Greek expletive, ne ton kuna. This is just a simple example, by the dog, literally alluding to Kerberos. If you swear in Plato, you say ne ton Tonkuna by the dog, but this could be translated in a witticism by the Eng English expletive dog on it. I did that in my A-level Greek exam. It didn't seem to harm my result anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty terrible pun, but it sort of works. Um, it finds an approximate equivalent, but one that preserves an allusion to the source language, if etymologically dubious. In that respect, it is, one might say, a pseudo, pseudo calc reflecting mimicry of the source language, but not translating literally, but functionally correct. It is a sensitive translation that finds an equivalent expletive in the target language. The one failure in this example is the expletive is limited to an American English of a lower register, or one might even now say an antiquated register of cowboy films, rather than the Greek expletive. Another method of translation that takes into account various factors, is aiming at a community of translation 
through a culturally specific component. A classic example is a translation of Proust's A la recherche du temps perdu by Scott Moncrief, whose translation is not the main one used now. In fact, Proust himself hated it. Uh, he translated A la recherche as remembrance of things past. As you have on the handout, this English phrase, remembrance of things in look of remembrance of things past, appears actually in the opening of Shakespeare's sonnet number 30, and therefore it has a cultural illusion when to the sessions of sweet silent thought I summon, summon up remembrance of things past. While not as literal as the later title under which the translation was published, In Search of Lost Time, it has a resonance through this illusion. Thirdly, Cardinal Newman's motto seems appropriate to mention here, cor at cor loquitur, um, heart to heart speaks, quite literally, uh, which is probably the influence on James Joyce in his Ulysses, who renders the phrase heart to heart talks. This is an exact calc of the Latin, so it looks rather literal, but in its use of the cliched English expression heart to heart, denoting a loving conversation, the English has a resonance of its own, and which actually might render the English cliché more profound. I think Ulysses was writing, or Joyce was writing before that terrible American TV show, Heart to Heart, or the American Detectives, which sort of spoiled this phrase as a, anything meaningful. Finally, an example of popular etymology. This is sometimes cited in translation studies, but not fully explicated. <laughs> The rendering of the German, angst in de Hosen, angst concern in your trousers, by the English, ants in the pants, represents first a culturally specific communicative paraphrase, similar to the example of Proust, because ants in the pants is an English expression. However, it can also be considered a modified calc in its structural and syntactic similarity to the German. But is more than a translation or a mere calc, the homophonic matching of angst and ants is very clever. And despite the quite different meaning, is a mimicry or mimetic of the source. A bit like the dog on it example in a way. The English, however, has a greater poetic effect to it with the wordplay in English of ants and pants. There is also a semantic shift as the scatological sense of the German is modified to a new imagery of irritation and discomfort, in English probably originally alluding to sexual excitement. So we've gone from scatological to sexual. <coughs> what is most interesting in this case, if you're reading a translation with ants in your pants, you wouldn't get this morphological matching between the source and the target. But the translator does. And there is a funny game being played by translators. They are having enjoyment at things which you as the reader of a translation doesn't have. But there will be an inner circle of learned people who know the original as well as the target. In all these examples, the translators are not resorting to communicative paraphrase, but offering both an allusion to the source text and a rendering that has vitality in the target language. And there's a danger when we talk about foreignizing or domesticating or taking the reader to the source or taking the reader to the target. We actually can do both at once. It's complex. Let me take for a few minutes one or two Greek examples. Um, I'll skip the first one, it's very dull. The second one is more interesting. Example B on the handout. On here, the Hebrew has, on the day of your distress, it will be remembered for you as heat. Hebrew home, on frost, so your sins will be relieved. It's a lovely passage from Sirach. In your distress, the heat will make, melt the frost, just as your distress will be relieved, evaporated by God. What's interesting is the Greek translations uses this word euthia, or ethdia, which is unique in the Septuagint and not the usual equivalent for the Hebrew word for heat, which is normally thermos or some such. As a translation, it's perfectly acceptable since its meaning of fair weather 
is appropriate for a description of the simile of warm weather melting frost. frost. So the, the Greek gives a word meaning fair weather, which seems appropriate for the equivalent of heat. However, as an example, we can compare the description of fair weather as a good time for sailing, which is passage C or the papyrus. Um, but Eudea also has a more subtle meaning. So in the Rosetta Stone, that famous thing over there in the British Museum, uh, we have um, a decree by Ptolemy declaring success and victory, um, and says he has undertaken much outlay to bring Egypt into prosperity, Eudea. So Eudea doesn't just mean fair weather, it also means fair conditions or prosperous conditions. And in the third example from Herodas, who's a third century BC Alexandrian, he actually says how great it is in Alexandria. He says, everything you can find elsewhere is there in Egypt. Wealth, the wrestling club, power, the peaceful life, reputation shows philosophers, money, young lads, and so on. It's, it, it's meant to be a bit of a, a joke. Um, but actually, he says, Eudea, here translated as peaceful life. But if you're in Alexandria, Eudea can also mean uh, nice weather, because you've got the cool breeze from the, mm. from the sea, which you don't have further inland in Egypt. So actually, this final passage, the author is playing on the meaning fair weather or uh, good living conditions, um, which takes us back to this passage in Sirach, where actually both meanings are appropriate, because it's on the day of your distress then you will have good living conditions, you there. And of course, the good living conditions are warm weather, which melts the frost. So the Greek has more meaning than the Hebrew. And translators often do this. They add more than is in the source text. And I know of at least one case of, a of the original author complaining that the translator has added things which he didn't put in there. But that's part of compensation in translation. So, to bring this together, when looking at Ecclesiastes, I think what we do have, and looking at these so-called literalistic translations, what we find, and if you went through all my evidence, goes on for pages, we find a complexity and a subtlety that neither omits of simple description or explanation, but is multiple and causal. To take that example of Sun, which I began with, the sun meaning um, with, but used as a sign of the direct object. How do we explain this? Well, it's actually rather complex. We have to take a number of steps. The first step is the simple one. That sun is, means with, and this little word in Hebrew sometimes means with. And so it's taking a lexical equivalent, a stock translation for two different words. But it's more complex than that, because sun in Greek is dying out. It's being replaced by meta, partly because also the dative is dying out, and so any prepositions with the dative are becoming less popular. So to use sun, you are being sophisticated in Greek. You're showing your literary register. So actually, whilst it's a very odd translation, you're also raising the register. Uh, if you look at Mark or Matthew's Gospel, Sun only occurs about four times. If you look at Luke's Gospel, it occurs about 27 times. And if, as we've already heard, Luke is a much better writer, and that's a good indication. But we can see it in papyri and other sources. So Sun is actually a sign of a sophisticated translator. But then Sun also is very interesting, because Sun with a verb and therefore, potentially with an accusative, is used in Homer. And here I'm to, back to the real Homer. <laughs> so that you could, there's, a, there's a feature known as the adverbial sun, which is used in Homer. So actually, what looks grammatically incorrect is grammatically correct in a Homeric sense. Now, you might say, what's Homer got to do with it? Well, actually, one finds in Apollonius Rhodius and one or two other writers, including Herodas, who I'm quoted just now, uh, Alexandrian writers of the same time period, they also revive the Homeric sun. 
So it's not just merely a guess that they might have known Homer. It's part of the educational system. So as well as, well as raising the register, you're also actually being very clever and saying this is, uh, this is a Homeric illusion uh, to show I'm an educated Greek. So what the author is doing is many things at once, but none of it uh, can be simplified. The same can be done for Kaiger. Kaiger, ge, which is vergam. This is a bit like our earlier examples. Vergam, and also in Greek, in Hebrew, is translated as kaiger. And actually, semantically, I think this matches perfectly. But gam and ge sound very similar. Uh, so you've got the phonetic matching. But ge has also dropped out of the language and is a higher register. And ge is actually also moving position in the sentence at the same time period and moving. Normally, you would say kai epoyesen ge. But over time, ge was coming after kai. In fact, the first example of this is precise. The first example I found in Greek inscriptions is first century BC, at the very time the kai ge tradition in the Septuagint begins. So there were, again, multiple causations for some of these little features in um, the Greek tradition. This is, and this sort of work is very, very common. Um, to just give you one example, the matching of sound and form between languages can be observed in certain branches of linguistic studies. In etymology, one can see how an association, irrespective of its scientific accuracy, can lead to the formation, or more properly, the success of a word. So Hyde's study of the Turkish language reform identifies a number of techniques. Turkish words that share the same sound with European words, especially French or Arabic, and of course, t French influence in Turkish, um, he called calc phonetic, phonetic calcs. So often the adjectival ending salel, which is possible in Turkish, was used because it sounded like French ending al or l. So you actually get a word in Turkish, dinsel, which is din, Deen in Arabic meaning religion, and sel, just because that's, that's the Turkish ending, but also sounds a bit like French words. Um, even better is the word for school. There was an old Turkish word for school, a mektev, but this was replaced by the reformers with the word oku, which both they claim to be derived from a Turkish verb, oku, to read, and yet also sounded like the French word école. So you had okul replacing mekteb, even though um, there was a perfectly acceptable Turkish word. So it was almost like camouflage borrowing. You pretend it's a Turkish word okul, but actually it is a French, sounds like the French école. In fact, they then claim there was an Anatolian dialect that has the word okul, but that's not <laughs> true. Um, and we find it in other words, uh, to give you um, an example, the word for cholera in modern Hebrew was cholera, uh, which sounds like cholera, but actually in modern Hebrew means bad illness. Or funnily enough, the word for protocol is protikol, which is all details of everything. Protikol, but it's protocol. <laughs> So um, what we find in the ancient translators, also modern neologizers do, and I think this is important, I'll finish it with this two sentences, I think this is an important basis when looking at the lexical understanding of translation and showing the complexity of any one language choice, any word lexical choice. A second stage then is to look at the bigger choice of why do this anyway, and why do any translation? And again, there are multiple explanations. So some people would say, oh yes, these, for example, literalistic translations were used as educating tools, teaching people how to learn Hebrew. Problem is, that doesn't explain all these word games and plays. And therefore, we have to think of a multiple explanation for the cultural significance of these texts. Um, and I, using functional translation theory, I've tried to do that, but I think I need to work further on it, communicative, expressive texts.
Thank you. Well, the lovely thing, just that you've given me nice feed for one of my examples from Ecclesiastes, just to do that one. Vanity of vanities. In Ecclesiastes, that's translated hevel, vanity, which in Aquila is atmis, which means a mist, because hevel, vanity, is a mist. In, in Ecclesiastes, it chooses matiotis, rather than just matios, which you get in the Psalms. Why matiotis? Because vanity of vanities is matiotis, matiotiton, which is in the iambic which is a tragic rhythm. Yeah. It's the meter of rhythm is produced by Matayotis, Matayotiton. So I think, yes, even these ancient translators, we can say, they, they weren't translating word for word, yeah. which people often think of. They're aware of the sound and the structure of the language. And when I said that once at the conference, someone said, actually, do you know Thackeray's poem? We who actually, Thackeray actually transliterates Matayotis, Matayotiton, vanity of vanities. He actually heard it himself. Um, Sound is very important, I think, in all translation, and that often explains why, for example, the King James Version is very popular, mm -hmm. because the sound... And why the new uh, English version of the Latin verse is very unpopular. <laughs> 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 As we heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Thank you. So how should we teach Hebrew and Greek to other languages? I, I've often pondered this because anything you teach them is the thing that they're going to remember. Anything you teach them first will be the thing they stick with. Uh, I mean, for one thing, we, some of the, someone has advocated we must never teach them there's a trilateral root in Hebrew, <laughs> partly because it doesn't exist, it's false linguistically nowadays, uh, but also because you're teaching them etymology or pseudo-etymology from year dot. Mm. So they think there's something special about Hebrew etymology, which is a false assumption. And in fact, all languages have roots. Science, conscience, it's the same root. We could teach it, it's not special about Hebrew. Um, secondly, it, it's less about what you teach them first, it's what you teach them second. So you have to teach them bait means house, because they can only learn one thing at a time. But then how do you do the second stage and teach them that it doesn't always mean house? And how do we therefore teach language more generally? I, th I think it's uh, often say little learning is a dangerous thing. And we should never teach people one year of Greek or Hebrew. It gives them a weapon, <laughs> which is very dangerous in the pulpit. We need to actually teach them, when we teach them a language, we need to teach them how to handle language. Which also means that even if we don't teach them any Hebrew or Greek, we should teach them language so they can understand the translations and how to interpret the English text. If we're doing all these translations, we need to educate them what a translation is. Again, I'll have to work harder. I was just going to say that my biggest problem learning Greek was really that my English was not, I didn't have full control over English. I didn't. So my English is much better now. I've learned some this morning, this afternoon. Um, it was much better having learned Greek because I had to learn about language in a way that I'd never done at school. And actually, the people who were best in our Greek classes at Greek, sadly, were doing it through their second or third language because yes. they understood how language worked in a way that I just cool. hadn't learned. But isn't there a way in which knowing your own language in terms of its grammatical structure is a, a second level? What I'm trying to say is that that is not the language. That is a formal, formalization, an analysis of the language that is a convenient way to learn it. Yes. So it's actually, then if you apply that to another language or transfer it to another language, whether it's Greek or Hebrew, 
it actually raises the status of the, the gra grammatical insights that you're provided with because they're not normative, they're derivative. They've been derived from observing the language, but they're presented as normative. Yes. And then they can be used to say this text must be wrong because it's not following the norms. And I think that's a very dangerous process. Indeed, and someone uh, on, a, on Facebook, someone raised a question recently. Uh, is there a list of examples where uh, Hebrew doesn't follow the grammatical rules? And then people try to explain, actually, all the grammar is derived from the text. So if the text doesn't follow, then it's the rules that are wrong, not the text. Let's take Davidson. I mean, it's presented, you know, that was the yes. standard textbook when I was learning Hebrew. It's presented as these are the norms. This, this is right. This is in a way where we have to make them think more about their own language because we do subtleties in our own language which we then expect another language not to do. Mm -hmm. We expect language to be magical, to do tricks for us, to get us deep into the exegesis. To, we can find, oh, the word is agape, then we're, we're deep, we're, we know more about it now. We never do that in English because we know it's more complex than that. So actually, using your first language as a tool to break down the stereotypes of the new language uh, would be helpful, and therefore, actually teaching, I'm actually beginning to teach students English now, just because they don't know what basic grammar is anyway. But actually, I'd like to take it one stage further and teach them the issues of what language is about anyway, deeper languages. I don't know. To what extent do you think, okay, there's a few translation theorists in um, your bibliography, to what extent do you think that knowing something about translation studies is actually beneficial for students learning a language? I think it's, it's a very good question because they're, all, they're always going to use translations. As you know, in Cambridge we tell them you must go out and buy an NRSV because all your Bible papers will be based on that without any particular explanation why. Um, it would actually be very good to include translation studies within any course because, and, and again, modern theologians, hardly any of them really read Hebrew or Greek and they all use translations. Uh, it would be very useful to actually teach people how these translations come about and what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like diction we were talking about dictionaries earlier. No one ever reads the introduction to a dictionary. <laughs> Even though that will tell you a lot about what it is, and it's a complaint of lexicographers. Similarly, hardly anyone reads the introduction to a translation. Um, either you just pick up any translation to see what it says, or you're recommended it by someone. Um, so that we don't know what we're doing when we look at translations. And the translator, again, the translator might be more clever than the reader. And that's a danger in the sense that uh, they're missing things. One of the things I've done with a certain element of prophet teaching uh, New Testament to students who don't have Greek or Hebrew is offer them a series of translations and get them yes. to think about it. And that has been, I don't know, marginally <laughs> useful on occasion uh, in, in un underpinning some of these questions about language quite simply, in a way. It is. It, it is a good exercise, but it's very difficult to do, and it takes up a lot of time. Yeah. It, it's a bit like, yes, it would be lovely to teach students translation studies, but where do we when? fit it into the curriculum? Yeah. And if there's no exam question <laughs> on it, then they don't come to the classes. That's a real problem. I'm glad you have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> Even though... I, uh, yeah, I do a few introductory courses on how to write essays and things like that, mm. and um, they stopped coming. And then when I get them in my third year, I said, I remember you didn't come to the last class. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go away and you write this essay because it's not very well done. You should have come to the class. But it, it is a real problem how we fit everything in. But it is, um, I hadn't thought about it before, but actually translation studies is central to any undergraduate teaching of biblical studies. Mm. But we don't teach them anything about translations. Mm.